So, dann würde ich sagen, auf zum Endspurt. Äh, so, uh, Zeit, let's get to the end. We didn't really lose time, but I mean, we just, uh, yeah, we are a bit over time. Uh, we're not where we expected to be at this time, but I, I'm going to do the uh, last presentation and I'm not going to prolong it artificially. So I hope that all the uh, new information will uh, stick in your heads. So I want to present to you the things that we're working on currently. So what you can definitely expect from us in the near future uh, that we are going to finish um, soon, and I want to give you a short uh, preview uh, because people can have you do some rough planning on this and this, and then I will show you our rough planning. And uh, I want your feedback as well. I, I want to do a little live survey here to find out which features you think are really interesting, and I'm quite curious about it. So. This is the roadmap. What are we currently working on? So it's things that uh, customers asked for as usual, and we are uh, happy about this and, and to have the customer as a sparring partner for, uh, so to speak, to work on a good concept for him. So one thing is a package, uh, Merita. Have you ever worked with MKP packages before? Okay, quite a few people have. So with MKPs, you can have software extension and you can package them. Uh, you can download them from Exchange. There could be multi-site extensions, uh, check plugins, whatnot. And what we're going to have in the near future is that the MKPs can not only be installed through the command line, like here, so also all operations can be done via Wato, uh, so not just installing, but also removal and creation. So you can make your own development site where you pr program your own checks and then you go to Wato. It will list to you what things are lying around unpackaged and then you say, okay, I collect it, make a package, uh, version number, name, and then you can just download it and deploy it somewhere. So one could think about having a connector to exchange for exchange probably some would say it's a bit of an app store but it's all free so all the packages that are on the exchange um, could be downloaded directly via the uh, site so this is something that we have an idea for the other thing that we really will implement in the next maximum eight weeks is this packaging. Then one topic that who was actually waiting for this automatic agent update? So <laughs> most of you were, so it's actually coming. So we already have the agent bakery that makes agents, uh, even host specific uh, packages. So we can say some hosts receive other packages than other hosts. And what's going to be new is the possibility to have this agents um, act, uh, updating automatically. So the automatic rollout cannot be done yet or the deployment because the first deployment of the package is the, well, that's where the update mechanism is in there. So, of course, for the first time, I have to do it manually or with the tool. But after that, the agent can um, update itself. And we pay attention to security as well. So making sure that you don't accidentally break things and also that attackers cannot just, um, well, insert things um, secretly because there is, is code in there, there's plugins in there that are often uh, have to be run with app administrator, right? So we have to protect these and make sure that nobody can put something in an agent that is, uh, well, who is not uh, trustworthy and we're going to work with uh, encrypting signatures. So on the monitoring system, the admin can actively sign agents with a passphrase and the agent polls for its updates regularly by itself. If there is something new, it can update itself. But we have also a central control option, like, for example, to slow it down, to curb it. For example, we have 5,000 Windows um, processors, so I have the agent rollout and I say, okay, I want to try with a few only, not with all of them. Let's say five per hour. And then if a problem occurs after a few hours, then not all of the 5,000 are messed up, but just a handful. So that is an idea. So this will be available for Windows and Linux for 
Linux is always very simple. For Windows, it's a bit more complicated. The architecture is not quite fixed yet, whether it's going to be within the agent or a second service in the background. I prefer a simple solution, so the agent would be uh, able to update itself. But technically, how are we going to do that? Well, we, we have to talk about this, really. Und. And you won't believe it, but hell has finally frozen over. Bam. Check MK supports IPv6. Yeah, last mentioned that yesterday, but we <laughs> waited as long as we could to make you suffer enough uh, to make sure that people really, really want it. And now we have two customers who actually needed this implemented. And once we do it, we do it right. So the IPv6 support is, of course, able to have dual stack monitoring as well and perform that correctly. So hosts have usually not just IPv6, I mean, usually they have or many cases they have both addresses and if it has both addresses then we have the concept that the have for once the check and k agent i want to ping that but we want to make sure that both addresses are accessible so these are two separate tasks basically so this is why we have to set a primary address which we call the normal address on which the agent is being pulled and then the second address is being checked by a ping to make sure that it's still accessible uh, in the other address pool. Which one is primary and which one is secondary can be set by a rule. So at the host itself, you have a rule saying I am IPv6, I am IPv4, and I am both, so which uh, families are supported, and the policies which one should be monitored can be controlled separately. And then, of course, this does not only work with the check and K agent. So what changes did we perform here? We had the uh, an X deconf uh, with APV6. This is very simple. It's a Windows agent. We had to uh, adapt a lot of things in the code, like OD from. So specifications of networks from which the, net, the agent has to be accessible. And also in the SNMP machinery, IPv6 is being supported like correctly as for inline SNMP as well as for the old SNMP. Uh, does anybody have the microphone here? There was a question in the room. Uh, so this all this works with dynamic addresses as well. So for example, if I have a privacy extension in there, so that the DNS name can be updated, and then you get a new DSS lookup all the time. Well, generally with CheckMK, we call it Dundain hosts. So the, the, the time when the name change happens could be at the check, uh, uh, or you can do it manually. So it should work. I haven't tried it, but in theory, it should be the same as it is now for IPv4. Right, so one interesting topic, we have a customer who said he needs the performance data with a resolution of one second, and we said, oh, how are we going to do that? I mean, one minute, that's easy, but one second in CheckMK, that's an illusion, but we have worked on a concept. We haven't tried it out yet. We are not sure how it works. It's still in the works, but we want to have a small part on Linux or Windows that is automatically actively doing performance updates via UDP with a central server. With a little overhead, and when the UDP package is being lost, then, well, I mean, one second is missing in the graph. But we have to make sure that the PNP graph is set, that it can also save one value per second. I mean, this is already possible now through the WATO rules. But this will not be true for all WATO metrics because it's quite complicated and you usually don't need that. So we will start with important performance data like CPU utilization. And with Windows, this could work for all performance counters. So this is uh, a job that was ordered and it's a bit complicated, but it should be quite exciting. What we're not sure if we can have like a live view, like a rolling graph, that would be nice. 
uh, that we even get there is, of course, uh, possible. So we have a few plans and ideas. The future. One concept is we could have MKPs and not only put plugins in there, but also configurations. For example, a set of 50 rules for the Win Console for the most important Oracle uh, data, uh, Oracle events. So this would be interesting for log file uh, occurrences and for collecting them. Another application would be I have distributed monitoring with many, many sites and I want to have a central configuration, but I don't want to push it onto my 1,000 locations, so I would like to package it and then have a template and, and provide that and then some other people like other um, uh, subsidiaries or something can can just uh, take this template and and use it as and, and still have a control function in it well so we need to be um, in the uh, we, are, we must be able to also set um, local configurations. So we have the local configuration, the factory second. In between, we have the packaged uh, settings. And on the local side itself, you can also, of course, uh, adjust the settings. So if we change the, exchange this yellow layer for um, an update, then it would be the same. But whatever has not been updated uh, with the package, we can do it manually through a new policy, for example. So this leads to a new style of central configuration, which is quite loose, and for some scenarios this is quite interesting. For example, we have a customer now who is monitoring 70,000 hosts, but there are several subsidiaries for different uh, world regions, and of course this would require a system like this. This is the concept behind this. Another subject we have talked about is the activate changes. Sometimes it just takes too long still. Um, in comparison to Nagios Core, we have made an improvement, but still it would be nice to click and then there's no waiting time. So we thought most changes that are being made in Wato are something with adding hosts or removing hosts or maybe service discovery. If we look at the fact that these are 90% of the changes, then we could say maybe the configuration shouldn't be done globally but per directory or per folder so for one folder it's I mean if, if you do it directly in the memory of the host this half second this is something we can really take and then when you click activate change it's bang it's done so because the micro core can do this uh, it, it can uh, reload new configurations within a, a split second. What takes time is creating the configuration. So if you split it up over files and compiling them, I mean, this doesn't take any time once they're ready. So we think that the activate changes for this case that I'm just adding as a, or changing hosts or services, this is something that, yeah, the, the waiting time could be uh, pushed near zero. Maybe there's an obstacle we haven't seen yet, but we are quite confident this will work. Well, this is also supposed to work in distributed monitoring, so if I see in Wato that this folder is on a remote side, then in that moment where I save, this has to be pushed over to the remote side, and most of you know that pushing is quite quick with HTTP. I mean, small file, uh, it's no problem to wait there for the user, this is no problem, and it doesn't really, he doesn't really have to wait, but then on the other side, it's already ready when I have to, uh, when I need it for the activate change. So once I have a global configuration change, I mean, this can be uh, applicable to every host potentially, so probably then I would have to regenerate the entire configuration. This is the worst case, so to speak. But, I mean, I would say, especially in large environments, this doesn't really happen very often, so it shouldn't be a big issue. In a whole different topic, many of you have managed services for customers. So who would say that you, do, you are a managed service provider? 
quite a few. So for these managed services, there are a few special cases that we haven't really covered in Czechemka uh, so far perfectly. For example, in distributed Vatu, in every site, we have all the hosts and users. Uh, which is simple to do like this, but of course suddenly there is uh, privacy and suddenly I don't want to see the other people's data. So that's one problem. And the other problem is, can I insert my own logo on this? And our idea was to officially do this. We have a managed service edition that has all these features. Maybe with licensing we can adapt it to this scenario so that so that is simple to implement, Maybe, perhaps if I have many small customers, so that the price model makes sense and, and is also worth it for you, not just for us, but especially for you. Yeah, this is something that we want to work on in the year to come. Then, of course, graphs and graph systems. Right now, the situation is that we have a service and the service has this and that many graph templates. This has been in, this was available in PMP for Nagios, then yesterday in the new graph we saw that. So the first wish would be that we can go and say, I would like to have, uh, I would like to have the ability to adapt these uh, templates in my network template. I always want the 90% percentile curve. And the result would be that I can add metrics or remove them, that I can uh, change uh, numbers, names, and then create my own graph that is still based on a service, and it would work on every service. And then a normal user should be able to create this just like you can change a view these days. So we have the typical idea. A user can say, I want my own sandwich, and admin can say, well, I will change the template for all the users. Step two is quite obvious as well, saying I have a graph and I want to put lots of curves in there from lots of different hosts, from one host this curve, uh, from the second one that one, and so on. These aren't templates anymore, but this is basically one separate graph that I need for a report or a dashboard, where there are certain elements in there with clear names. I mean, what we have now are templates which work for every service. And this should be able not only with programming through the command line, but with an editor within the multi-site. And step three is the third variant of this, of graphing. There are situations where I have a pool of 10 web servers and I want to have them in one graph and look at, it, look at them in comparison. So of course I not could do this with what I've just shown you, one global graph and yeah. But it would be even better if I, in the multi-site, I would just look for up for the look the services up. I look HTTP in host group X, for example, and then I click multigraph, bang, and then there is the graph in which I use the template that is already available. But instead of one value, I have ten values in there, in different colors, for example. So I can say. I would like to see the sum or the maximum, I want to see uh, exceptional values. So with every list of services, there would be one button, multigraph, and then I would get the graph because all the services are entered there. So usages would be which of the servers has the worst response time or well, how could you combine all the space? Uh, how is my total usage growing? Or I have a switch with two ports that should be connected. In case of trunking, now I want to know the combined traffic and not the one port traffic. With historic data, you can do a lot more. You can have, like, I, I don't want a graphic curve, but I want a number. 
Wir haben ja die Metriken, äh, we have metric data, schon gespeichert and I mean they're Jahre. stored for years, but we can only access them via the little graphics um, image, the graphs image. Sagen, it would be interesting to have uh, numbers which I can derivate from that, uh, derive from that and then show the also that numbers in, in the GUI of multisite. For example, I have 150 ESX hosts, which 10 can be shut down? Which 10 are almost idle or at full, full performance? So I take the CPU utilization from ESX monitoring and I calculate the average from last month and this won't be a graph, this will be a number and then I can put this number in a table and look at the first 10 for example or the last 10. So that is something that we really would like to do. And I'm really excited about what's going to happen and what's going to come out. Then I have a few questions and Lars uh, asked me to give some of them to you. We'll be talking about appliance. I, I would like to make a survey because that is uh, non-binding and we have thought about a survey mode that is quite interesting. So those of you who think that the feature that I'm presenting you would like to see you should raise your hand and the best Bastian will <laughs> take a picture <laughs> and Lars will then count the hands. <laughs> so Bastian, can you cover the, the whole room? Okay, first point, you make a picture from the screen and then take a picture of the people, okay. So, who would like to see, it would be a good idea to have a Rec 2 with a lot more processing power, like 16 cores, 32 gigs, something like this. Who would like to see that? Good. All right. The other way around, yesterday few people talked to me about that, uh, would it be nice to have a check MK appliance that is not just very cheap, but also small and simple to start with a simple positioning, for example, 2,000 uh, subsidiary, and in each I want to have a monitor with 50 hosts, but I don't want to start a giant rack there, and no, no rail, uh, racket for that, like 100 euros, 200 euros, just Ethernet, uh, an LED, nothing else. Maybe a recipe, but of course it has to be industrially, like suited for industry, so at least have a nice uh, casing. Okay. Then customers said, I want to have the CheckMK clients in Amazon Cloud. <laughs> Who is interested in that? How about IPv6 support in the appliance? So CheckMK can do it now, but the appliance, I mean, if you cannot enter it anywhere, the, the appliance should probably get an IPv6 uh, address. Central management of CheckMK appliances. So virtual or real appliance, I've deployed in, in locations and I want to have a new, new firmware in a new location. Netflow. Netflow support in CheckMK. <laughs> more and more fingers coming up. Last chance, all right. I think this was very interesting. So final slide. <laughs> Your feedback to the possible logo. Who thinks this is horrible? <laughs> Who thinks this is better than what we have now? <laughs> Who does really like it? Okay. <laughs> All right. 
Gut, dann bin ich jetzt mit dem Fachlichen durch. Okay, then this is the end of uh, the danke, professional part. Thank you very much for your interest. I think I thought it was really interesting and, and it was fun. I, I thought it was great that so many questions arise and that people really uh, paid attention and were interested. We have one final request. We have a feedback uh, questionnaires laying around. If you want, uh, we would appreciate it if you fill them in because we would like to know uh, which of the presentations were relevant to you or interesting for you or are there things that you would like to see next year in the conference that weren't covered this year or that maybe weren't that good. So you have received the questionnaire. They should be on the chairs. Just um, leave them at the counter in the back and Diana will uh, take them from you. So I thank you very much for being here. And I will be here for a while. So if you have any more questions, please go ahead and ask me and my colleagues will be here as well. And I really hope that I will see as many as possible of you again next year. Thank you.